Uh, my name's Josh. If we haven't had the chance to meet, I've been here at Movement over the last year, uh, actually as a church planning resident, and so uh, excited that we're ramping up toward being sent uh, here just in the next week uh, to fully be in Sunbury and start Bright City Church. Uh, we have a lot to kind of gear up for as we prepare for the fall, um, but this is going to be my last message here at Movement. So if uh, if you're our guest this weekend, it's a pleasure to meet you, and this will be the last time you see me. Um, but if we've been, you know, developing a relationship over the last year, if you've uh, gotten to kind of watch our story, uh, it's just been an incredible honor to have a place to call a home church in a, a very uh, long time of, of change for us, of, of moving from Akron to Columbus to living uh, in different places and kind of being homeless for a few months to finally landing in Sunbury. Uh, we are so grateful for you as a church family, your support, your prayer, your kindness to our kids, to my wife Sarah, to me, and um, we're excited for what God's going to continue doing through movement. Um, God's up to some amazing things. And so uh, as we jump into this, uh, we're going to wrap, uh, I'm going to wrap up, uh, not the series, but just uh, my part of these conversations. We've been in a series called Lenses, and we've been trying to approach uh, different topics that we experience in our world through the lens of the Bible. And while there's probably every topic you could uh, specifically dive into, we've been dialing into Micah 6.8. And what Micah 6.8 says is that um, God's people are those who love mercy and who do justice and who walk humbly with God. And so what we've been doing is we've been trying to say, okay, what does God's heart for mercy and justice look like in the world? And how might we take some topics that can be polarized or can be politicized and not get into the politics of them, but just say, okay, what's God's heart on this? What, not, what, not what is Josh's agenda, not, not what is the American agenda or a political agenda. What, what does God say about this? How would he call his people to enter into that conversation, to interact with um, the people he has a heart for? And so uh, just a little bit of context before we dive in today. When I was 25, uh, I was doing seminary. I was studying a lot. Uh, I had a lot of classes on Bible and theology and preaching and teaching and all sorts of things. But one project I had that I was so grateful for was I was asked to um, find a local non-for-profit or um, a, a, a something in the community that was doing good. And I was asked to, to volunteer and to kind of uh, throw myself into that and then to write a, a paper on my experience. And so I had no idea where to begin. Honestly, my, my idea of following Jesus and, and how to be a pastor was pretty limited to just like what I did in the walls of the church. And this was so helpful for me. It pushed me outside the walls of the church and into the community. And I was up in Akron and I found this uh, group called World Relief. They're a non-for-profit that helps resettle refugees uh, a, a lot here in the United States, but all across the world. And they do it in the name of Jesus. They do it holistically. There's, there's so many incredible things about it. And what's a little bit different for a refugee than for maybe any other kind of immigrant is an immigrant may be moving so that they, because uh, they have a vision of a better life. Like they're, they're kind of like, I want to I wanna establish my family over there. I want to experience uh, that over there. A refugee um, is often displaced without that desire. That they often have to relocate because of present dangers they are experiencing in their, in their home country, and they are trying to find peace and safety. It's not, it's not like their first choice. They didn't choose to do that. And uh, I, I learned so much in this time. I learned that 42,500 people are forcibly displaced every day. 42,500 people. I learned that refugees have to go through more checkpoints to enter the United States more than any other person coming into the United States. Many of the refugees I interacted with had taken them years and years and years. Um, I learned that despite kind of what I had heard in my narrative of uh, how immigrants and refugees affected the economy, that overwhelmingly research had shown that refugees were good for the economy, that they contributed and that they were effective and also um, using our economy. It, it, was, it was a benefit to both. And then I was also gently reminded that our country was founded by refugees, <laughs> right? I mean, um, it just blew, blew my worldview open a little bit. And I spent time with actual refugees coming from Nepal and uh, uh, Burma and Syria uh, to Akron. And often what I do is, uh, well, the first thing I signed up to do is I was like a driver. 
like go to the airport and pick them up and be like, hello, I am Josh, and you're in America now. And uh, you, uh, there was often appointments they had to have in those first few weeks, right? Like health screenings, social security card. And sometimes that went really great. And I was like, man, like they understand English well, or like their kids understood it better than them. And then sometimes I was pulling out Google Translate and I was like, well, you know, what's Burmese for like social security? And I'm like, trying to talk with the person. I mean, I I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Just trying to help families and individuals relocating. Um, I remember often I'd like knock on their door, you know, I'd be like, hey, like come hop in the car. And uh, they'd be like, no, come on inside. They'd be like, sit down. They'd give me coffee. It was like so good, like Turkish coffee. Oh my gosh, it was like so rich. And I'd be like, we got to go to this appointment. They're like, no, sit. And they like just wanted to be so hospitable. Um, We actually spent a whole year uh, going about every other week with a, with a Nepali family. Uh, we kind of got assigned to them as, as almost just, I can't remember, good, good neighbor friends group? I, I'm looking at my wife, Sarah. I can't remember what we called it. But basically, we committed to be involved in their life. And we'd take our kids over. I actually have a couple pictures of us hanging out with them. Uh, our oldest was just a few years old at the time, and Judah had just been born. And we'd just go over, and we'd play games sometimes, like we'd read mail, um, or we'd help the kids with homework, and we'd just hang out. We'd, we'd share stories. We talk about what they're doing in life. And uh, it was a really transforming experience. I would have never chosen to do on my own, but because I was forced into it, because I was asked to do something like that, it uh, has affected me in very deep ways. I spent several years, we spent several years serving with World Relief, and it opened my eyes to differences in my culture and other cultures, food, drink, dress, customs. I uh, many times would just wear my shoes into someone's house. They'd be in the most, you know, trying not to be offended away. They're like, you need to leave your shoes outside the house. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. Um, It shaped my perspective and the realities that refugees were facing as we talked in the car or spent time with that family some of their needs that they had as they relocated. It, it opened up my eyes to some of the global crises and, and, and wars that were going on at the time and, and the sources of that displacement for them. It, it helped me see what churches and, and not-for-profits and individuals can do to help. But it also hit something deeper in me, more than just refugees specifically. It, it kind of hit in me the importance of, of how many of us can feel like strangers and, and that we're also going to encounter strangers. I actually was just looking up for a simple definition of stranger and I kind of found three parts of a definition. Here was one definition of stranger. It's someone who is neither a friend nor an acquaintance, right? They're unknown. I don't know who you are. I've never met you before, I don't, or I don't remember meeting you, right? That happens all the time at church. You're like, are you new here? And you're like, I've been going here for 10 years. <laughs> um, a stranger can be a foreigner, a newcomer, an, an outsider, someone who's not part of the group. They don't belong, right? And so they're unconnected. I haven't seen you around here before. You don't look like you're from here. The, the third use of a uh, stranger as a definition was one who is accustomed to or unacquainted with something, right? They're unfamiliar. I didn't know I had to take my shoes off outside of the house to go into the house, right? In America, what I do is I just like, we go into the house and we kick our shoes wherever we need for them to go, right? They're just like spread all throughout the house, (laughs) especially if you have little kids. A stranger. It's someone who can be unknown, someone who's unconnected, or someone who's unfamiliar. And here's what we need to hear this morning. God has a heart for strangers, He has a heart for every version of that definition of strangers. And and we're going to unpack that Micah 6-8 mentality of how do we uh, love mercy and do justice and walk humbly obedient with God toward strangers. And this uh, definitely doesn't have to apply to refugees exclusively. In fact, we're going to kind of move on from that a little bit and think more broadly about strangers. But they're, they're certainly included it, it, it blew my mind open to a, to a whole idea of, of feeling like an outsider that I had never thought of before. And I think that this topic will serve us best if, if we consider that broadly, instead of just one particular kind of migrant or ethnicity or group. Here's something that can be helpful for us as well. Anyone can feel like a stranger, but all of us will encounter strangers. Um, when we first got married, 
we went on a honeymoon, right? We went to Cancun. And I'd never been out of the country before, so I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, we got there, and we decided we were going to save a lot of money, and we were going to go buy all of our groceries. And we were going to like eat lunch and breakfast at the hotel, and we'd be so good. This was even before the whole envelope system thing I was talking about, right? So we got on a bus. And uh, we paid in pesos, you know, and we're like going to the grocery store. And man, they would pack these buses full. And I remember one time, uh, all of a sudden, the bus just stopped. And everyone started getting off. And they were all chattering. And we're like, what's going on? Do we get off? Like, is everything okay? And uh, someone finally could understand our confusion because we're just sitting there like, what do we do? And someone finally came over to us and was like, "Uh, a car hit the bus. And so we have to get off the bus so that... Um, they can take care of, of the damage that's been done. And we're like, okay, so then we have to like, get off the bus. We're all cramming into noon. It was wild. I remember one of the things we got at the grocery store was I loved mangoes. So I got mangoes, right? And I brought them back to the hotel. And everyone warned me about the water in Mexico. Don't drink the water. And so I was afraid of water in Mexico. And so I didn't wash the mangoes. I just like cut them up. And I was like eating them like this. And what I learned is that mangoes have this toxin that's similar to poison ivy. And if you rub it all over your face, you get a terrible rash. And so here I am on my honeymoon in Mexico with this rash all over my face. Uh, Yeah, it was hard to resist. And I like went to the CVS and I'm like do you have any like anti-itch cream? And they're like, senor. And I'm like, I don't like, look at my face. I have rash itch. Make it stop. Like I I was just like so out of context. I was so frustrated because I was on their turf. Like, and and I wasn't equipped to handle that. And I need, I like desperately needed help. And it was frustrating because it, it wasn't their fault. It was my fault. I walked, I, I walked in, you know, flew into Mexico and was trying to figure out how life worked, how language worked, how custom worked. And I was trying to vacation and, and doing a lousy do- job of it. Anyone can feel like a stranger, right? You, you've maybe traveled and felt that before. But all of us will encounter strangers. Even if you never leave the country or the state of Ohio or Columbus, <laughs> you're going to encounter people with different customs and cultures and languages and backgrounds. And Columbus is becoming incredibly diverse. I had to do a lot of research on demographics as a church planner. It's, it's increasingly diverse. And as we explore God's heart for strangers, we need to think about all sorts of different people who fall under this category. Refugees, immigrants, international families, minority ethnicities. Here's what we know about God's vision for the world, his kingdom, is that God's kingdom vision is multi-ethnic. When when we're at the end of time and God makes all things new, what he imagines is people from every tribe, tongue, language, nation, from every part of the world together with him. In fact, Jesus, when he commissions his disciples, he says, go to all nations and make disciples. In Acts 1.8, it says, go to the ends of the earth. Like, the whole world is included in God's restoration plan. So so that's the end goal. We're moving toward a multi-ethnic, one community under the name of Jesus. And what I mean by kingdom vision is it's it's, uh, how God wants the world to be and what he is making the world to be. But the Bible will specifically talk about strangers. And in fact, the word that it uses to describe what a stranger is is this word, ger. Ger can often be translated as stranger, foreigner, a sojourner, right? Someone traveling, uh, an, an alien, right? Someone foreign, not from there, an immigrant. If you look through your Bible, if you look through the Old Testament, you'll see this word pop up many times. In fact, it appears 92 times in the Old Testament. And basically, it's someone who's not an Israelite, Right? The, the, the Old Testament is, is written around the nation of Israel, and so the foreigners in their land are non-Israelites who journey through their land, who stay in Israelite territory. They are people of different ethnicities. They are people who are unknown, unconnected, and unfamiliar with Israel. People who are traveling, trading, fleeing persecution, marrying, moving, visiting others. And God knows that strangers are susceptible to neglect, abuse, and being taken advantage of. In fact, God's heart is to love, protect, and invite the foreigner. Over and over again in those 92 times that 
um, stranger comes up in the Bible, we see things like this in Psalm 146, that the Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for orphans and widows. We see in both in Leviticus and Deuteronomy commands of what Israel should do when they encounter strangers. Here's Leviticus 19. It says, don't take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Remember that you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, it says, the Lord ensures that orphans and widows receive justice, and he shows love to foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must love foreigners. For you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. Did you pick up on that repeated thing in both of those verses? The motive for why Israel should be loving to outsiders, to strangers, is because they were once strangers in the land of Egypt. We actually went through a series on the book of Exodus just a few months ago, and that's the whole story of God's rescue plan of Israel out of Egypt, where they were slaves, where they were foreigners, where they were abused and neglected and taken advantage of. And so, buried in God's commands to love those who are strangers is remember that you once were strangers. Remember what it was like when you were treated in Egypt. That's the motive for what should shape how you now have an opportunity to treat the foreigners in your land differently. Because that's where they were. We actually are given that same kind of motive. Even though we're not Israelites, we, if we jump all the way to the New Testament to what Jesus has done, we get the same kind of you once were outsiders mentality. In fact, we can relate as outsiders who've been brought near by Jesus. For most of history, God's Chosen people have been Israel. They've been selected to know him more intimately than any other people group on the planet. But that does not mean that God's heart is not for the rest of the world. In Genesis 12, when God calls Abraham, he says that he's going to bless Abraham's family. He's going to make him into a nation. And that as he blesses his family, he would be a blessing to the rest of the world. So is, is God's heart to bless just on Abraham? No. No. That, that through Abraham's family, the rest of the world would be blessed. His heart is for the world. He's choosing Israel. He's choosing the family of Abraham as the means to do that. But the rest of the world has struggled to be integrated into God's vision for the world, primarily because of Israel's lack of carrying out that vision. So Jesus changes all this, right? John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he sent his son, he knew he couldn't bank on people anymore. <laughs> he had to send his own son. And we're going to read a, a longer part of, of how we're supposed to understand what Jesus has done for us as outsiders. And I want you to, to all this that we've already talked about can be used as a lens of, okay, I, I need to see myself there. All, this, this whole talk this morning means nothing if, if at the end of it you still don't see yourself as someone who was once an outsider. It, you'll never find a deeper motivation, and God can't possibly give you a deeper motivation than the fact that this is what you once were. So be careful to, to hear yourself in this. I want you to hear yourself in this. It's going to sound a little unfamiliar with Israelite language, though. So in Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22, this is going to be up on the screen for you, but you're welcome to open your Bibles or open up your phones and follow along. Ephesians 2, um, Paul is unpacking what Jesus has done for us as outsiders. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God, and without hope, but now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Gentiles, that, that word we see right away, is simply non-Israelites, right? They're gare. They, they are strangers to Israel. 
It's everyone but them. And every insider culture has this, right? You might say they're non-Americans, right? And every culture has slurs, right? You see it right in there. They, the way that the, the Jewish people talked about those who weren't Jewish was they were the uncircumcised heathens. They, were, they didn't look like us, and they didn't know God. And what I find incredibly relative to this is that we allow... Um, the narrative and media of our culture to often shape how we view outsiders. Like that, that's what's been on my mind the most about this and probably what was most true about me before I started interacting with those refugees was my primary way of thinking about the outside world was not shaped by God's word or even my own experience. It was shaped by what I had heard from others that I had never experienced as true for myself. And that is a very dangerous place to be because now God's not shaping your worldview. You don't have his lens. You have someone else's lens. And that's a lot of authority and power to give over to someone else. Listen to the language that's, that's shown in that passage. You were outsiders. You were living apart from God. You were excluded. You did not know the promises. You were without God, without hope. You were far away. This is the kind of experience we're talking about. This was Israel and Egypt, right? This is you and me without Jesus. Everyone is an outsider somewhere. And with God, we're all outsiders to God. But look at what Jesus does to change all that. Keep reading in Ephesians 2. It says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united the Jews and the Gentiles into one people, when he in his own body on the cross broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. And he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. And together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by the means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. So what did Jesus do? Repeated many times, he defeated hostility. He, he put to death and buried division, specifically ethnic division, ethnic hostility. And the other thing he does is he makes a new group of people, one group of people. He doesn't elevate one to be superior over the other. He says, both of you, uh, I'm not going to erase your ethnicity, but I'm going to give you a greater reason to be united than ethnicity. And it's me. It's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is the reason that we can have greater unity. He, makes, he changes the system and makes peace between the two groups. Because the problem we all have is that we are more easily divided than united. This is why being a stranger is not just an ethnic problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a communal problem. It's a personal problem. It hurts personally. And it, it's a very primitive way that we try to avoid pain and be safe is by becoming tribal. That's them. You're in. You're, you're out. How does Jesus break down the walls of hostility and make one new people? We just sang about it. And we're, we just read it too. It's through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. This, this is why Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection are so transforming. Is it's not just a historical event. They're like, that's really nice. That's pretty cool that Jesus died on the cross and, and that he rose again. He's saying, like, I'm, I am burying everything that you were, not to quench it, but to create new life in it, to create you into who you were made to be. And, and what brings us together is the new life in Jesus, this tangible person, this tangible thing that he's offering, that Jesus can become the most defining part of our life, not the things that divide us uh, from others or the things that are different from others. He says, you are one in me. I am the most real thing about your life. As this part of Ephesians 2 wraps up, he says, you Gentiles now are no longer strangers or foreigners. You're citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family, and together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with the cornerstone being Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, 
becoming a holy temple for the Lord. We represent God. He dwells among us. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. They are no longer Gentiles. They're no longer non-Israelites or strangers or foreigners. The new language is citizens, family members. They're home. They're together. They are part of this. And we have to see ourselves there. That's where we were. Before we were brought into the family of God, we were the outsiders. And when you've been an outsider and you've been brought in, you begin to care about helping those who are outsiders. When, when you've experienced what it means to be brought in, you now know what it looks like to bring others in. And that, that's why this is a part of being obedient to God and loving mercy and doing justice because if we don't show hospitality to strangers, has the gospel really transformed us? It hasn't. That's, that's not a conversation about your eternal destination of heaven or hell. That's a, have you allowed the gospel to transform every part of your life? If you don't show hospitality to strangers, it hasn't transformed every part of your life. Blessed are those who are merciful because they will be shown mercy. If you're not merciful and hospitable to strangers, you haven't allowed the gospel to transform that part of your life. And so our big idea today is that God's people offer hospitality to strangers and they help outsiders become insiders because that's what we were. And we all can experience the distance on that level of what our lives are like now that they've been changed by Jesus and he's brought us in and he's shown us love Three times, the New Testament uses the word hospitality. I want to show you all three of them pretty quick because it's pretty sweet. <laughs> I'm going to put them all up on the screen. This is Hebrews 13. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters, and don't forget to ho show hospitality to strangers. Romans 12. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. And 1 Peter 4. It says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over, over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Here's what I want you to notice. Jesus' followers are called to love in two different directions. It happens in all three of those verses, the only three times we see hospitality. The first direction we love is that we should love each other. Did you see that? It says, loving each other as brothers and sisters, right? When God's people are in need, to love each other deeply. This is the word Philadelphia, right? Um, and it's a two-part word. Philo means brotherly love, right? City of brotherly love. It means um, befriending. We are called to befriend Delphia, which is just family. Two-part word, befriending family, <laughs> Right? Mom, mom wants all the kids to get along. <laughs> right? It's happy Mother's Day when, when, when everyone's not fighting. Befriending family, Philadelphia. The word hospitality is philoxenia. Befriending, right? Brotherly love. Xenia. Strangers. Outsiders. So love goes in two directions, right? Insiders, we love one another, Philadelphia. We love outsiders, Philozenia. Same kind of love, two different directions. So is our love complete? Are we hospitable? We were talking on our team that hospitality's kind of gone away. I, I remember when we first showed up here a year ago, um, Mark got up on stage and was like, the Taylors are here. <laughs> and we were like, hi. He's like, everyone take them out to lunch. And we're like, how many lunches are we going to go on? I'll be honest. We went on one. And, and we, we, we got to know and, and love people in other ways. We served together, right? And we've, we've been in group together and things like that. But... Um, that, that's a pretty hard thing to do, right? Is it, invite someone out to lunch. For some reason, that's become a little bit culturally harder for us. When I, I was talking with like Ben, he was like, I remember back in the day, like you always went out to lunch with someone. 
But for me, that's, that's a little bit less familiar. What if we could recover that lost art of hospitality? Not entertaining people. Entertainment's not a command in the Bible. Hospitality is. And the difference between entertainment and hospitality is, are you trying to impress people, right? How long are you vacuuming? <laughs> Go out to eat. Then you don't have to vacuum, guys. Come on. We've already said this, but I just want to reiterate it. This is what biblical hospitality looks like. It loves, it protects, and it invites. And the reason I know that is because we connect that all the way back to what we said about God's love for those who are ger, who are strangers. God loves, protects, and invites the outsider. So our hospitality should look that way. Let's just sit on the power of invitation. An invitation can make all the difference in the world. And let me tell you something else. An invitation rarely, if ever, does harm. I've never had someone get mad at me for inviting them to be part of something. I have yet for that to have and have happen. I do have people who have felt left out because I haven't invited them. Invitation is a powerful thing. It, it's, <laughs> it's like the only resource we have in church planning right now, is we just kind of meet people and invite them to be part of things. We're trying to protect not having an insider mentality to just be like, hey, we're new here. Oh, you're new here too? You want to come be part of this with us? Sometimes it's a yes. Sometimes it's a no. If it's a no, it's usually not because people are offended that we invited them to something. An invitation can lead to changing people's lives, to them following Jesus. Uh, it, it, that the, the refugees, let's go back to them. This, this is what World Relief says about refugees. There is no better healing experience for a refugee family than getting to know an American family that chooses to come alongside them and guide them through their, their journey. That was why we were part of this, this good neighbor relationship, it was because World Relief had studied and known that the, the refugees who integrated best into the United States were those who integrated with American families. We have an international family on our launch team. They're not a refugee, but they've only lived in Columbus for four years. And I sat him down for coffee the other day, and I said, hey, I'm just really sensitive to insider culture and what it's probably like to experience our church plant or just even our community um, as an international family. And thankfully, he said, we've felt so included. And he said, do you remember when you invited us over for Friendsgiving? You guys ever do Friendsgiving, right? <laughs> and we were like, yeah, yeah, we did Friendsgiving because we didn't want to do group that week. <laughs> and um, he was like, we've never known how to do a proper American Thanksgiving because we're not from here. <laughs> right? They'd never been invited to Thanksgiving. That, that got me thinking, like, we're about to celebrate 4th of July in a few weeks, and... Uh, <laughs> They've probably never celebrated that either. <laughs> we'll show them how to properly do that, right? Like lots of hot dogs, uh, probably things I shouldn't mention uh, on recording. Here we go. Um, they were brought in. All I did was invite them to eat turkey. We felt so included. No one had ever done that before for us. I can only tell you the kinds of things that international families at times have experienced, not even from words, but from what they, they just see people, people's body disposition from their neighbors and those in the community. A friend of mine, a pastor, Tony Lavigny, he says this about hospitality. He says, in preaching, we get to hear the gospel. In music, we get to sing the gospel. But in hospitality, we get to feel the gospel. I was invited in. I was an outsider, but I wasn't treated like one. Someone invited me in and showed hospitality. Um, we, we were also chatting this week about in ancient customs, you know, hospitality looked a lot different. In fact, uh, one of the ways that um, if you were hosting someone, you would show if you wanted them to stay longer or if it was time for them to leave, right? In the Midwest, you kind of got to do that. Well, 
And that's like kind of how you tell people they got to start like getting out your door, but then you got to talk for like 10 more minutes in the doorway. And then it's like, well, and you know, you kind of move a little bit further and, until you get them to their car and you're just, you know, like waving to them <laughs> awkwardly. Well, in ancient Near Eastern cultures, what they would do is you would usually have um, a, a jar that you were drinking out of. And if uh, wanted you to hang around, you dump more water in, in the cup. You're invited to stay longer. You'd feel a little bit more, you'd feel a little bit more. And if it started to get down and the kids were getting a little crazy, you wouldn't fill it up again, right? It's like, it's time for you to go home. <laughs> and you know, it was, it was custom. Sometimes, you want to know what people would do? They would fill up the cup so that it was overflowing. You know what that meant? You can stay as long as you want. Wouldn't recommend doing that if you don't mean it. Um, <laughs> That's what God's like. My cup overflows. You don't have to go anywhere. Your family. You belong here. Don't be unfamiliar. Don't be a stranger. What if in just small ways that began, began to change in you this week? That without grumbling, we showed hospitality to strangers. That we didn't guilt trip ourselves, but we just committed to say, God, help me see the ways I can be hospitable. Help me be reminded that my cup overflows because you don't, you don't kick me out. When I was an outsider, you drew me near. That just because they look different or sound different or do something different for me, I probably all the more reason need to show them hospitality. That is God's heart for you. I want you to hear that more than anything else. That is his heart for you. Your cup overflows. I'm gonna pray as the band comes out and give us some space just to invite God to remind us of that. Father, um, we could talk about this even more at length, but what we really want is you. We want our cup to overflow, not because we know a lot of things, but because we have you and your son Jesus, and all those times we've personally felt disregarded and displaced and like outsiders, Father, you, you remind us that's not how you treat us. We don't have to be unfamiliar with you. We don't have to be unconnected from you. We don't have to, to miss out on your love and your goodness. Fill us up with that kind of love, with that kind of hospitality and let it overflow to even people that would be the last kind of people we would expect to interact with. Change our homes and our groups and our communities and our worlds. Make it the way you want it to be, God. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.